Hi everyone, I'm Corey and I'm going to be teaching understanding imaginative writing today. Thanks for being here. I see people coming into the webinar already. I always like seeing some of these same names again and people I've seen in my other classes. Hi Anya, hi Andrew, Carter, Cassidy, Ellie, Emmy, Isaiah, um, probably Anjali is here too. I know you guys usually watch on the same computer. <laughs> Jacob, Luna, Milo, Ranbeer. Hi everyone. All right, so as more people keep on coming in, I just wanna talk a little bit about what we're going to be covering today. Last week, I did a webinar that also covered imaginative writing but in that one, we were covering kind of simpler imaginative writing. In today's webinar, we're going to take it at a little bit of a higher level, go over some more complicated examples with a little bit higher reading level. And if we get to them, we're gonna cover a few more types of imaginative writing that we didn't get to last week. Uh, we're doing imaginative writing today and tomorrow. So I don't expect that we're gonna cover all the types today we'll probably finish covering the types tomorrow. So I hope I see all of you then. Um, but either way, we're gonna be talking about imaginative writing and the different purposes for studying it and understanding it. So, here we go. All right, so two reasons to study imaginative writing. These are to understand what you're reading and two, to become a better writer. There is a lot of writing in, in what you read that is not always just plain writing. Um, there is you know, a lot of plain writing in the world, but there's a lot of writing that you can't understand just based on the literal meanings of the word. So we're gonna talk about that for a second. The, when you read something like a newspaper article or you read in a cookbook, or the back of a cereal box, or the ingredients list on something, you're usually gonna be reading plain writing. All the words mean exactly what they mean. The writer is trying to communicate information to you in a clear way that doesn't take a lot of leaps of imagination to understand. Uh, if I was trying to read the instructions for changing a tire on my car and the person who wrote it was using a lot of imaginative writing, I'd probably get annoyed. <laughs> because I just wanna understand exactly how to take the bolts off, put the tire on or off. I don't wanna be hearing a lot of uh, flowery language. But when we read something like a novel or we read poetry, the writer can use a lot more ways to like activate our imagination and get us thinking you know, more creatively. That does pose problems though, if we don't understand exactly what they're trying to say. So by examining the different ways that writers write with imaginative writing, we can start to understand a little bit better what they're doing and be able to communicate better with them. Because um, understanding imaginative writing is all about communication. You want to be able to understand what the writer is trying to communicate to you. And that second goal that we have there, the better that you understand what the writer is communicating and the better you, you, you get at uh, being able to take in that information, then you as a writer can use those same tools and start applying them to your own writing. Uh, the better you understand it, you can do a little bit less plain writing and have a little bit more fun with it and use your own imagination a little bit more and start activating other people's imagination a little bit more. So let's jump into some of these examples and you, if you were here last week, you will probably uh, you know, already understand some of these types of imaginative writing that we're gonna talk about, but we're gonna go a little bit more in depth and we're gonna read some examples that are a little bit higher reading level. So I hope you'll enjoy it. All right. So as always, if you have any questions, you can type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. I already see a lot of people are saying hi. <laughs> hi Anjali, hi Emmy, hi Anya, uh, hi Ellie, hi Milo, hi everybody. Um, yeah, so, all right. 
Here we go. Okay, so the first type of imaginative writing that we're going to talk about is overstatement. So in overstatement, the truth is intentionally exaggerated. Let's go over what that means. Intentional is when you do something on purpose. Uh, overstatement that you didn't do on purpose might be more similar to, you know, fibbing or lying. You know, if somebody says, how much homework did you get done? You're like, oh, I got done 10 pages. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, that's not telling the truth exactly. But in writing, if you are intentionally overstating something with the purpose to kind of activate somebody's imagination, that type of imaginative writing is called overstatement. So let's look at some examples of how this works. I'm going to read you some paragraphs from this course that's called Understanding Imaginative Writing. In overstatement, the truth is intentionally exaggerated in order to get a point across. His feet are the size of boats is an overstatement. The truth is that his feet are very large, but intentionally exaggerating their size really gets the point across. This exaggeration makes overstatement figurative. This reminds me of, I think in the first Harry Potter book, uh, when they first introduce Hagrid and they describe him, I'm pretty sure they say his feet are like the size of baby dolphins or something. <laughs> um, I don't think even, you know, even, a, a, even him being half giant, I don't think his feet were probably really the size of dolphins, but they were large. So overstatements are commonly used in everyday speech when people exaggerate to get points across. I'm starved. I'm so tired I could sleep for a week. And they're so rich, their servants have servants are all examples of this. Overstatement is both vivid and efficient. It gets the idea across using just a few words rather than a lengthy explanation of facts. So vivid and efficient. Vivid there meaning, of course, it brings an idea into your mind with lots of like pictures. You can really clearly see what the person's talking about. And efficient meaning, you know, you can get a picture across in a short amount of time instead of it taking a long time. You know, when, when people say, I'm starving. Well, they're not literally starving usually, but they're getting across in a vivid and efficient way that they're really, really, really hungry. So to go down to some of these examples, there was not a field of sweet potatoes, but an endless sea. This comes from a book where they're talking about people that are uh, farmers or have a farm. And they're saying that it wasn't just a field of sweet potatoes, but an endless sea. So exaggerating the size of the field communicates how big Jody's job of hoeing, you know, it's one of the farm jobs when you're taking your tool and you're getting the weeds out, how big Jody's job of hoeing sweet potatoes seems, endless. So in the Q&A box, I would like you guys to write just a few examples of overstatement. Try to think of a way to describe something using overstatement or exaggeration. And that could be maybe something that's in the room with you or just something that you think up right now with your imagination. But describe something and try to help me and the other viewers at home uh, get a really vivid and efficient description of something by using overstatement. And I will bring up the Q&A box and I'll look for your answers for that. Uh, while we wait for some people to write some answers, I see a couple questions here. One viewer says, what does exaggerated mean? So exaggerate, it's a really similar word to overstate. It just means when something is a certain way, but when you describe it, you make it sound bigger or more that way or stronger than it really is. Um, if I say, my orange cat Libby is the size of a tiger, that's overstatement or exaggeration. Um, you probably understand she's not really the size of a tiger, but you'll probably understand that I'm saying that my cat is really big. Um, if I say that, you know, uh, my friend was so late, we all fell asleep. Well, 
it's not likely that somebody would be so late or that we'd even stick around if somebody was that late. But you're trying to exaggerate. You're trying to say, you know, we got bored waiting for that person. So I hope that uh, helps you understand exaggeration. Um, another person here asks about, um, I scrolled past this one example in the, <laughs> in the uh, textbook there because I didn't want to uh, give you guys too many words that you might not know. But somebody saw this word in this example and they're asking what it means. He says, what does kin mean? As in, I can hold a barrel of meat. <laughs> So in that example, um, that, uh, what that person was saying, what it, they were trying to write it the way that it would sound if you heard it. Because when people have like a strong accent or they don't speak with like totally proper English, it can sound odd or strange. And a lot of writers, they like to uh, write how a character talks the way that it sounds. So for this person, if they're like, I can hold a barrel of meat, well, they wrote it kin, K-I-N, instead of can, C-A-N. So there you go. Oh, and how big is a bushel? <laughs> um, that one you might have to look up in a dictionary to get the exact amount, but I'm pretty sure a bushel is like a kind of a big basket size. Uh, that uh, measurement isn't used a lot in modern days, but back in the days when more people uh, worked in farming, a lot more people would know that a bushel was like a basket sized amount of like, uh, you know, vegetables or fruit or wheat or something else. But don't quote me on that. That's a good opportunity for you to go look in a dictionary or look online in an online dictionary and find out exactly how big a bushel is. In fact, if somebody wanted to go look that up and write it into the Q&A box, I'll read your answer out a little bit later. All right, so here are a few examples of overstatement. Jacob says, I'm so hot right now, I could explode. That's a great example. Good job. Uh, Isaiah says, I was so hungry, I could eat a horse. Awesome. <laughs> uh, Isha says, the apple was as sweet as candy. So... Yeah, these are great examples of overstatement because I've, I've, you know, eaten some sweet apples in the past, but they're almost never as sweet as like a really sugary candy. So that's good overstatement. Cassidy says, his voice was as loud as a foghorn. Her eyes sparkled like stars. The flashlight was as bright as the sun. Those are great examples. Anya says, the dictionary was as heavy as a seven-year-old child. <laughs> that is great. Uh, Emmy says, my blanket is as big as a black bear. Fallon says, the grass was as dense as a forest, for it was hard to see through. Yeah, that's a great example. Good job, Fallon. Oh, and Fallon asks, so kin is supposed to be could? Yeah, I think in that example, uh, they were trying to make it sound like the word can, you know, but it could be could too. It's just kind of the way it sounded in that example. All right. And Milo says, that cheese was so moldy that it looks like it was painted blue. Great. Um, Emmy here uses another word that we use sometimes in imaginative writing. Um, they say, isn't that like hyperbole? Yeah, that's another word. Hyperbole is also, uh, these are all um, similar words kind of describing the same thing. Hyperbole also means um, saying stronger or exaggerated or more than you really mean. So you're totally right. Good job. All right. So you guys made a ton of great examples. There's so many coming in. I can't read all of them right now, but I hope I'll get your example on the next one if I didn't read it on this one. Oh, here we go. Jacob says a bushel is equal to 9.3 gallons. <laughs> So if you imagined like nine jugs of milk, like the big ones with the, the handle, imagine like nine things of milk here in front of you. Imagine a basket that could hold nine jugs of milk. That's how big a bushel would be. Thank you guys for putting that in there. Fallon jumped in here too, so thank you. All right, let's move on to the next section here. 
All right, the next type of imaginative writing we're gonna cover is a simile. So a simile is describing a thing by comparing it to something else. This happens so often, you guys have already been using great similes in your examples of overstatement. Because oftentimes when you're using imaginative writing, you don't just use one at a time. You might be overstating, but you're also using a simile. You're trying to describe one thing by saying how it's similar to something else. So let's read some examples of that. In a simile, something is described by pointing out a similarity between it and another usually unrelated thing. Because if you describe something by comparing it to something else that was really similar to it, um, it might be like, what's the point? How, how much are we actually activating our imagination? If I say, the brown rock was similar to a gray rock. It's like, yeah, <laughs> it probably is. But was that description really worth our time? So in a simile, we're usually pointing out a similarity between a thing and something that's unrelated, but it'll make our imagination come alive by hearing that description. Here it says, the seagulls whirled overhead like blown leaves. So a seagull and a leaf from a tree, they're not really the same. But in the way that maybe they're flying through the sky, you could see in your mind, okay, I've seen leaves blowing through the air before. That's what the seagulls kind of looked like as they kind of flew through the air. Maybe they're moving in a jumbled fashion. Maybe it looks like they're not flapping their wings in a, you know, uh, in a way that they're trying to move, but maybe it looks almost like the wind is blowing the birds around. The seagull's movement is vividly described by comparing it with the motion of leaves blowing about in the wind. And this comparison creates a clear picture of just how the seagulls are moving. It would be difficult to describe it accurately without the comparison, but finding something with a similar movement and stating they are alike makes it easy. In a simile, the similarity is clearly expressed with a word or phrase like similar to, she had wild white hair similar to dandelion fluff. Like, his eyes glimmered like stars. As, sour as a crab apple. As though, she shooed the boys as though they were puppies. Resembles, his cruel laughter resembles a snarl. Seems, he seems turned to stone, then browner than an otter, and so forth. So if you're ever reading something and it makes you stop for a second and go, what? Like, wait, what are they saying here? You can try to spot some of those, uh, those words that show you that they're comparing two things. If it says that he seems turned to, to stone, well, the seems word is your clue. He didn't literally turn to stone, but it seems as if he did. So maybe he's standing very still with no movement. So you can look for those. Uh, they give a list down here of some fun ones. The water made a sound like kittens lapping. Like when, you know, kittens are like licking at milk or water in a bowl. The raccoon reached out a tiny black paw like a baby's hand. The gray fur was as soft as his mother's flannel nightgown. So in every one of these examples, they're taking something and they're comparing it to something else. That's not really the same, but there's some similarity that can make a really fun image in your mind. All right, so in the Q&A box, I want you all to write your own simile by taking something in the room around you or just something that you think of and compare it to something else. So yeah, I'm gonna see if there's any questions in here while we do that. <laughs> Emmy says, I love similes. Yeah, <laughs> me too. They're one of the key parts of uh, poetry and a lot of other writing that's you know very uh, flowery and fun is when you start comparing it to other stuff. <clears throat> All right, so Isha says, 
he was as brave as a lion. There's that word as that shows it's, it's a simile. Anjali says, the ice cream melting like cream going to the bottom of a boba drink. Awesome. <laughs> Emmy says, my mother washed plates. Oh, my mother's washed plates look as shiny as a new pin. That's a great example. Andrew asks, what time does this seminar end? Uh, we're ending at 3.15 today, or approximately. Cassidy says, he was as strong as Hercules. Awesome. Milo says, the orange was like a piece of sweet candy. Awesome. Anya says, my blanket is as soft as a chinchilla. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've petted a chinchilla before. That's a great example. Isaiah says, he fell so hard, it sounded like a cannon. Awesome. Jacob says, while washing the dishes, the faucet gurgled like my brother when he drinks. <laughs> That's great. Um, Fallon says, his hair spiked up as if he had cat ears. Great. Alaya says, Maya was so tall that she towered over everyone like skyscrapers over city streets. Very good. That was a good example too of combining overstatement and simile because saying that they're so tall they tower over one like everyone like skyscrapers over city streets that would be really 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 much taller than somebody else so great exaggeration and great simile and andrew here he is as big as a whale isaiah i was skating as fast as a cheetah um anjali asks what is a chinchilla uh, they're a type of, um, a kind of, I think they're a type of rodent, but they're usually kind of, they have like gray and white fur and they're really soft. Um, look up a picture on Google images. You can just search for chinchilla or maybe watch like a U YouTube video when we're done with the webinar. <laughs> um, but yeah, they're, they're really super, super soft pet animals. All right, so great examples, everybody. Okay, so the next type of figurative language is really similar to a simile, and that's a metaphor. In a metaphor, you're describing something by calling it something else. So let's compare that really quick to simile. In a simile, you describe a thing by comparing it to something else using words like, uh, like, as, but in a metaphor, you just straight up say that something is something else. So let's look at some of those examples. Like a simile, a metaphor describes something by comparing it with a different and basically unlike thing. In a metaphor, however, the comparison is not expressed with a connective word, such as like, resembles, or similar to. Look at this example. After so many days in the desert, his tongue was a wad of cotton. In this metaphor, his tongue is compared with a wad of cotton, but the comparison is understood rather than being expressed by a connective word. Life is a hard road. She has a heart of gold. And he's a hard nut to crack, which means he's stubborn, are all metaphors. Although at first glance, a metaphor can appear to be a factual statement, it is of course an imaginative description and has to be taken as one. A metaphor is actually figurative and figurative is another way of saying basically imaginative writing. It's not plain writing, it's not literal writing, it's figurative or imaginative. It's basically telling you, we don't mean exactly what we're saying, we're trying to get you to use your imagination here. So the word metaphor is derived, that means it comes from a Greek word meaning to transfer. In a metaphor, the comparison transfers descriptive information from one thing to the other. Look at the metaphor in this sentence. The bear bellowed out a thunderclap of a roar. 
even though there is no comparison word, the bear's roar is being compared to a thunderclap. If this comparison were stated in simile form, the bear would have a roar like a thunderclap. So again, these two are very similar, but metaphors can be a little bit trickier. Um, sometimes people that are not native speakers of a language can have a lot of trouble with these because they understand each of the literal words in the sentence, but what it's saying does not make literal sense. It takes, um, uh, it takes some imagination. Sometimes you have to work it around a little bit to try to figure out, well, what is this person saying? You know, they can know what thunderclap means, but you have to kind of take a step back and say like, oh, okay, they're saying that it's as loud as a thunderclap. We have a metaphor going on here and we have overstatement. Um, cause no bear can actually roar as loud as a thunderclap probably. So let's get what they're saying. Okay. They're saying the bear roared really, really loudly. So write a few, uh, a, you can write an example in the Q and a box of a metaphor and make sure that when you write your metaphors, you don't have any comparison words. We don't want to see the word like, as, um, compared to anything. We just want to see that you're taking something and you're describing it as something else. And after that, we're gonna move on to some new types of figurative, fig, of uh, imaginative language that we didn't cover last week. All right, some, some great examples coming in already. Isha says, her hair was silk. Awesome. Emmy says, her long brown hair was as long as a flowing river. Okay, that's a great comparison. Uh, we do have the word as long as there. So how could we rewrite that so we take out that connecting word? Could we just say, her long brown hair was a flowing river? Writing metaphors, when you start creating them for yourself, it can feel a little bit you know, strange at first sometimes because you're saying that something is something else that it's not. Um, we kind of feel like we want to put those connecting words in there to, you know, it's almost like you're trying to tell the reader, I know it's not really this thing, but it's okay. In a metaphor, you're, gonna, you're going to trust the reader to make that connection for themselves. It's okay to say, her hair was as long, or her hair was, see, I almost did it there myself. Her hair was a flowing river. And you're just going to let the reader figure out what you mean by that. So, All right, this attendee says, life has many roads. Great. Uh, another attendee here says, the tiger's roar was as loud as a hundred trains racing against each other. That is an awesome comparison. Very good job. But we have to ask ourselves, did we use a connecting word or did we just say it was the thing? If we say that it, the roar was as loud as a hundred trains, we're again using those connecting words. So how could we rewrite that so that we don't have any connecting words and we just say the thing is the other thing? Then you'll have a metaphor. Milo says, the donut was heaven. <laughs> awesome. Fallon says, his hair was stone from all the hairspray put in it. That is a great metaphor. Good job. Another attendee here says, I am as sharp as a knife. So great comparison. Uh, let's just try to rewrite it. How could we rewrite it so we take out the connecting word there? <laughs> awesome. Emmy rewrote it. She says, her hair, her long brown hair was a flowing river. Great job, Emmy. Cassidy says, the mountain was a menacing shadow in the distance. Awesome. <laughs> Jacob says, my brother's face is a chipmunk. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, Isaiah says, the water was so cold, I felt I got hit by ice. Awesome. Alaya says, she had midnight dark eyes. Very good. Anya says, the cheetah was racing with the wind. Wonderful. Emmy says, the children were flowers growing on the playground. That's awesome. That sounds like poetry. Fallon says, the goat was so spoiled, he was a prince. Wonderful. All right, great job, guys. All right, let's move on to our next type of imaginative writing here. Personification. Oh, I think we briefly covered this last week, but we'll go over it a little bit more. Personification is giving something human qualities. And that word there, quality, a quality is kind of what makes something what it is. What are the qualities of something? Qualities of something could be um, what it's able to do, how it looks, maybe how big it is or how heavy it is. Um, these are all qualities. Uh, human qualities would be things about people or things that people can do. So real quickly, what are some things that people can do that maybe objects out there in our physical environment can't do? Um, if we just take a physical object like this coaster here, um, a person can think, but a physical object can't. Um, a person can move their body around and do things, but a physical object can't unless somebody moves it. Um, people can talk, they can create, they can, you know, eat, they can do all sorts of things that, you know, objects or things in the physical universe can't really do on their own. But in personification, we're going to give those human qualities to things as a way of describing them and using our imagination and talking about them. So let's look and see what our textbook has to say about this. To personify something is to give it human characteristics. That word there, characteristic, it basically means the same thing as quality that we just talked about. It's sort of the things about something that uh, make it what it is. All the things that we could describe about it or that it can do. So imagery in which something that is not human, an animal, an object, an idea, is given human characteristics is called personification. This is a very common type of figurative language. Here's an example from the first page of a book called Johnny Tremaine. Boston slowly opened its eyes, stretched, and woke. Of course, the city couldn't literally do this, but comparing the city to a human waking up conveys, in a few imaginative words, the picture of an entire city awakening to a new day. And convey there basically just means communicates. Um, so this language is communicating to you, in a few words, the city waking up just like a person wakes up at the start of the day. Here are more personifications. Notice what is being personified in each. Midnight laid its cloak over the sleeping town. So let's break that down for a second. Midnight is a time. It's a part of the night. It's midnight. Um, midnight is usually very dark, but a time of the night can't do something. It's just a description of a certain point on the clock that we're at, right? But it's saying that midnight laid its cloak over the sleeping town. So we're treating a time of the night that's usually very dark as if it's like a person. And this person is taking their cloak, their, you know, th this, this clothing item that's usually uh, very big. It usually can cover a lot of area. And it's saying that midnight, this time, this dark time of the night, laid a cloak over the town. So we can kind of get the uh, image in our mind that it's very, very dark. At least that's the image that I get. That this isn't uh, like the Arctic Circle where maybe it's uh, really bright all night uh, in the summer. 
No, here it's very dark and midnight is covering up the town with darkness. Um, let's go down to this third one. The sunrise reached long fingers into the clearing. Okay, so a sunrise, when the sun is coming up, the sunrise does not literally have fingers. It's the sun and it's coming up over the horizon. So if the sun doesn't really have fingers, how could it reach long fingers into the clearing? And the clearing is a space in the middle of the forest or the trees where there's nothing. So what I get from that is that the person is in this clearing and the sun is just coming up and we're starting to see sunrise kind, uh, or sunlight kind of poking through the trees. We're starting to see sunlight coming in, maybe as if a hand was reaching down into the clearing but it's the hand of the sun. So personification can be kind of tricky because you're definitely asking the reader to make a big jump of imagination. You're asking the reader to take something that is not alive, that does not have a body and cannot really do things. And you're trying to, you're trying to kind of ask them, well, imagine if it could. <laughs> Um, I know my students in the past have had a lot of trouble with these and it can take a little bit of work to kind of think through it and think how treating something that's not alive as if it is alive is supposed to give you, uh, using your imagination, a picture of what's happening. So uh, if you have any questions about that one, because I know it can be a little bit tricky, write them in the Q&A box. But if you don't have any questions on it, go ahead and I want you to try to come up with your own example of personification. So take something in the room or just something that you imagine and try to treat it as if it was alive. What could be an example of that? So I'm going to take something, this globe sitting here. <laughs> and I could say, I stared at the globe just sitting there like someone who had overeaten and was ready to go to sleep. Um, I'm trying to think of someone that maybe they ate too much, like after a big Thanksgiving meal, and now they're sitting on the couch and they're all like, ugh. And I'm just saying the object is just sitting there, like someone who overate. So the object is not really alive. It can't really sit there like it ate anything because objects don't eat. But I'm trying to make a connection in your mind between this lazy, maybe person that doesn't, uh, maybe this person ate too much and something that's just sitting there. Um, again, this one can be a little bit tricky, but try your best to make up your own example in the Q&A box. All right, Fallon says, the plants looked sad because they had not been watered. That is a great example. Plants can't really, well, most people <laughs> agree that plants don't have emotions. So if you said that it looked sad, you're kind of treating the plants like they're a person that can have emotions like happy and sad. So that's a great example. Isha says, the trees were dancing in the wind. That's an awesome example. Trees can move when the wind blows on them, but can they really dance? Not so much. So if you say they are, we're treating them like they're alive. Great job. Um, here's another example. The flowers sang as they happily bloomed. Yeah, so in my imagination, um, I have uh, my family, we have some flowers in our garden. And right now the tulips are starting to bloom. And do flowers really make a sound? No. But treating them like they're singing as they open up and you see all their bright petals. Yeah, I can get an image of that in my mind. That's really fun. Fallon says, the sunflowers looked longingly towards the sun. That's a great example. Good personification. Um, and the sun was asleep while the rain was awake. <laughs> great job. Cassidy says, the tree's long fingers reached out as we passed by. 
I love that example. I've had plenty of times where you're trying to get through some tree branches and all the branches are kind of clawing at you. Even that clawing at you. Uh, we're treating these things like they're alive, like they're a person when they're not. So great job. All right, you guys have a bunch of great examples there. We're gonna go over one more type because we're running out of time. The last one we're gonna go over today is illusion. An illusion is referring to something from history, legend, or earlier works of art. This is where illusion is interesting because we often in a culture have a lot of stories that we're all familiar with. We have, you know, something like um, a story like Harry Potter. Not everyone's read it, but a lot of people have read it. So if I refer to something that happened in the book, like earlier when I mentioned Hagrid, a lot of you, maybe not all, but I'm willing to guess that most of you knew exactly who I was talking about. So if I'm writing my own story and I say he was as big as Hagrid, that is a simile, some comparing two things, but I'm also using illusion. I'm taking something from an earlier work of art, in this case, a book, and I'm kind of counting on you knowing what I'm talking about to understand that connection that I'm making. Um, in older books, if you read books by famous authors like Charles Dickens or um, a lot of uh, what they would call the classics, you'll see these writers do this a lot. They, when they were writing their books, they were kind of understanding that most of the people reading their books would be pretty familiar with uh, Greek and Roman myth. Um, most of the readers in England and in America at that time would be pretty familiar with the Christian Bible, for example. So they could take things that had happened in the Bible or in um, Greek or Roman myths, and they could refer to them in their own writing. And they were counting on that their readers would know exactly what they were talking about. So because we don't have a lot of time left, um, I pulled one example out of a musical that I really like. You may have heard of it, it's called Hamilton. And in this musical, there's a line where the main character has made a big mistake and his, the wife character is singing about this and talk, basically singing to him when she says this. She says, do you know what Angelica said? That's her sister when she read what you'd done. She said, you have married an Icarus. He has flown too close to the sun. So the main character, Alexander Hamilton, his wife is saying, basically, you are an Icarus and you've flown too close to the sun. Or at least that's what her sister said to her. If you, don't, if you haven't studied any Greek mythology, this reference is gonna go right by you and you're probably not gonna have any idea what they're talking about. But for those of you out there that have studied Greek mythology or those that haven't, there's a story about a inventor in ancient times that he was trying to escape from this place and he created a set of wings for himself and for, and for his son. Um, and if I remember correctly, the, there was wax used to uh, attach the feathers of the wings to the, the structure and they go flying out of this prison that they're in. And the inventor says to his son, don't fly too high. The son's name is Icarus um, because we don't want to get too close to the sun and have the wax melt. But the kid does that anyway. He's kind of prideful and he's kind of, um, he maybe thinks he's kind of invincible and he flies up too high. The sun melts the wax and he falls out of the sky. If you've read that whole story and understood it, you can understand what this character is saying when she says that the main character, Hamilton, is an Icarus. He's been too prideful. He's been too uh, thinking he was invincible. He's gone too high. He's gotten too close to the sun. And now he's, uh, he's had a big fall. So in illusion, you're taking things from earlier works of art or from legend or history and you are trying to help your reader right now understand what's going on by making that comparison. And it's definitely a type of imaginative writing where 
you're kind of having fun with your reader by doing this because you're kind of taking a chance that they know what you're talking about. <laughs> because if your reader has not read the story and is not familiar with the story that you're referring to, they're probably going to miss it completely. But an argument could also be made here for you as readers, making sure that you read very widely. It's important to study Greek mythology and study a lot of your history and, you know, these older works of art, because there's probably references and things that you're reading right now that you might not understand what they're talking about unless you're familiar with this greater body of work. So we're pretty much out of time. We can't make any examples right now, but I would like to see you all back tomorrow for the next part when we're gonna talk about some more imaginative writing. Um, I'm gonna give you a little assignment. I want you to think of an earlier work of art or something from history or something from mythology and try to think of a way that you could make a comparison in writing. You're gonna make an illusion by comparing something right now to something that happened in the past that you think the other viewers here and myself will probably be familiar with. So come up with your own illusion, write it down, and tomorrow I'd love to see you back and read your examples. So I hope you guys have had fun today. I will hopefully see you tomorrow. Bye.